you know what time it is. It's my favorite time of the week, and that's giving you a portfolio update. Hey, everybody, I hope you had a fantastic week. Thanks so much for tuning in for a week eight portfolio update. Let's go ahead and jump right into it. Lots to cover, no different than the other portfolio updates. Let's go ahead and kick things off with M1 Finance. As you know, I have two brokerage accounts, M1 and Robinhood. Right now, my M1 for the week is down about 2%. That's about $2,400, and my portfolio total stands at $120,000. Now, I'm not convinced that these numbers and percentages and the gains slash loss are correct, and that's because I recently transferred over a few stocks over from my Robinhood brokerage. So this is something I was talking about in the last few updates, there were a few more stocks in my Robinhood brokerage that I wanted to transfer over. Now, earlier in the year, at the very beginning of January, I transferred quite a few stocks over from Robinhood to M1. And as the weeks went by, there were a few more positions that I also needed to transfer. So let's give you the quick rundown. On the 21st of February, I transferred over three shares of Texas Roadhouse. 10 shares of ORCC, 14 shares of MPW, 1 share of Lowe's, 51 shares of EPD, and 10 shares of Cube. Now, only three of these are going to be newer positions. Texas Roadhouse, I already have this in my long-term growth slice. Lowe's is also a stock that I have in my long-term growth. And EPD is a stock that I have in my quarterly dividend slice. So really, the only new additions to the M1 portfolio are going to be ORCC, MPW, and Cube. Cube is a position that I added, I think, late 2022. So let's take a look here at the total holdings. I go from 43 to 46. And it's funny because I almost feel the need to like justify why I hold so many stocks. This goes back to the video that I put out earlier in the year. And I had the question, you know, do I own too many stocks? I just think that this is just my nature as an investor. I'm very content with holding all 46 of these positions. Could something change in the future and maybe I you know, eliminate a few? Yeah, duplication is a big part. Um, I don't wanna own too many stocks from the same sector. That seems to be more likely to occur with some of the ETFs that I have in my portfolio. But right now, I'm very, very content with these 46 positions. So let's go ahead and give you an update on all the purchases I made this week. As it turns out, Monday was a holiday. So there were only four trading days in the week. Let's go ahead and take a look at what I purchased on Tuesday, the 21st. I've got five buys, ExxonMobil, Union Pacific, Texas Roadhouse, AVGO, and Walmart. The following day, Union Pacific, Texas Roadhouse, ExxonMobil, AVGO, Walmart. The following day, Again, Union Pacific, ExxonMobil, Walmart, ABGO. And then Friday the 24th, we had six buys, ExxonMobil, ABGO, Visa, Walmart, Union Pacific, and the Southern Co. Now you'll notice here, the last two days, Texas Roadhouse uh, was not among the purchases. And that goes back to when I transferred over uh, those two additional shares of Texas Roadhouse from my Robinhood brokerage those got pushed over on top of my existing uh, position. So let's go ahead and take a look here at the long-term slice. If we look at Texas Roadhouse, this now has a slightly increased uh, percentage, 2.6% out of the target allocation of 7%. And if we click on this, you now see that I own a total of six shares. So again, M1 is doing what it's supposed to be doing. And again, only giving money uh, to positions uh, that have uh, the lower Uh, percentage. Something else to point out, and you may notice it as I scroll up and down, but I changed slightly uh, some of my target allocation percentages in my long-term hold slice, and it's going to be Johnson & Johnson. So Johnson & Johnson is a stock that I've been following. There's been a lot of news related to the lawsuit that Johnson & Johnson is currently facing, and I still intend to hold Johnson & Johnson. But for me, you know, I want to make sure that anything that's in my long-term hold slice, it's really a stock that I intend to hold long-term. And this is sort of the nature of becoming a more informed investor. When there's news of lawsuits that could potentially, you know, cost this company in the billions of dollars, 
um, you know, that's something that you as an investor should be aware of. Now, I'm sure there's more to it than just that flashy headline of, you know, Johnson & Johnson faces billions in lawsuits. But for me, it's certainly enough from what I've read that I need to do additional research. And again, I didn't uh, take Johnson & Johnson out of my portfolio altogether. I think that would have been maybe a bit premature. But you know what I can do is I can go ahead and reduce that target percentage from six or seven percent. I dropped it down to one percent. And that's great because there are other right stocks in this slice that deserve to be funded. We've got McDonald's here, Visa, SO, Union Pacific, ExxonMobil, Walmart, AVGO, Lowe's, and of course even Procter & Gamble, Texas Roadhouse, AbV, Pepsi, Coca-Cola. Oh, I don't think is going to receive any funds for quite some time. This also was included in a big transfer that I did at the beginning of 2023. You can see here my target percentage is 70%, but the actual percentage is 57%. So O is not going to receive any money uh, for the foreseeable future until all of these uh, have more of an even weight. So I'm going to keep you posted on Johnson & Johnson. And it's just me following the news, wanting to be better informed. And honestly, if Johnson & Johnson is going to experience uh, a price drop, well, then I could always sort of wait uh, where I see uh, a more favorable stock price for me to buy at. And, you know, I'm doing daily cost averaging on truly a daily basis. So why not take advantage of just holding or pausing those regular investments uh, until I figure that out a bit more? And of course, I'd love to hear from you if you are holding on to Johnson & Johnson. What's been your thoughts or reaction to the lawsuit information? Has this made you uh, dump Johnson & Johnson as a stock in your portfolio? Are you loading up? Are you buying more because of uh, presumably a dip that J&J &J is going to experience? I'd love to hear from you. Throw it there in the uh, comments. How many shares do you have? Or is this something that you're now going to add because of the recent news? So that gives you a pretty good glimpse at everything in my M1 portfolio. Let's close things out by showing you my funding history. Uh, M1 will give you a running year-to-date total. And you can see in 2023, I have funded in my M1 portfolio $1,500. I'm currently up to $250 per week. I'd love to increase that number to $500 a week, maybe even more. Currently, I have not yet completed my taxes. That is going to be the determining factor as to how much more money beyond or above the $250 on a weekly basis that I can contribute. So stay tuned. I'm, I think my video is gonna be titled Tax Drama because I am expecting to owe a significant amount. So stay tuned on that. So moving over to Robinhood, let's give you a snapshot of the portfolio. As you can see in my Robinhood portfolio, I am down about 1% for the week. That equates to be about $4,300. And my current portfolio balance stands at just over 391000 So I think Robinhood Gold has been a good decision for me. It is $5 a month. But you can see here just this month, I am close to earning $50 for the month of February. Remember, this 4.15% is APY. So this is calculated on a yearly basis. And then you divide that number by 12 months and then Robinhood pays you out at the end of every month. So lifetime in interest, I have earned just over $160. This month, I am set to earn another, eh, we'll say close to $50. We have a few more days left in the month. So there we have uh, how things are looking for the week in my portfolio and what I've accrued via cash earning interest. As far as reoccurring purchases, you know that I daily cost average to two stocks on a daily basis. That's UPS and Costco. Costco, I am buying $20 worth of shares every day. UPS, I am buying $10 a day. Another purchase, though, I did make uh, this past week might come as a surprise. I saw that Domino's uh, did not do well during earnings, hence here the sharp drop. Uh, this has actually been a stock that's been on my watch list for a while. Admittedly, I did jump in a bit prematurely. I was able to grab one share uh, at a cost of $307, and I wish I would have waited because currently, as you can see, uh, Domino's is going for under $300, but that's okay. I wanted to buy at least just one share, follow it. That's something that I do as well. You know, I'll just buy kind of like 
a tracker share, right? Where I just buy one and I track that and see what it does. Um, so I'll keep you posted on that. But those are the purchases for the week in Robinhood, just the usual Costco and UPS, but I did purchase one share of Domino's. Okay, moving on to dividends. Not too much action in the M1 portfolio. You know, every time I record these portfolio updates, I typically do it on a Friday night. And because of that, uh, I missed out on being able to report a dividend from last Friday, which was the 17th. I did receive 28 cents. Remember, I held Costco in my M1 portfolio and I decided to cut and sell the shares because I was obviously investing in my Robinhood. Uh, so uh, clearly uh, I had uh, you know a fractional share in my M1 portfolio that earned me 28 cents, but we should not be seeing any more Costco dividends coming my way on the M1 side. Uh, going back to the following week, uh, not too much in the form of dividend action. I did receive $1.58 from SPHD. And that's all that I've made in dividends for M1 for week eight. Let's now take a look at those dividends that I received on the Robinhood side. Going back to that video that I recorded last Friday, I wasn't able to include the dividend that I received from the Costco shares in my Robinhood. So last Friday, I did receive $9.94 from Costco. From Starbucks this week, I received $53.08. That $53.08 equates to owning 100 shares. Starbucks is going to remain in my Robinhood brokerage because I'm actively selling covered calls against those position or those shares as well. And then to round out, the last dividend that I received for week eight is going to be from SPHD, and I received $14.65. I also own and hold SPHD in my M1, but because I am actively selling covered calls against a hundred of the shares in my Robinhood, until I can close out that position, I haven't been able to move over these hundred shares to my M1. So during last week's portfolio update, looking at the total amount of dividends received in February, we left things off with earning $241.69 for Robinhood, $392.95 in M1 for a total of $634.64. Let's go ahead and add and calculate with the newer received dividends and see what that total is. So here you have it. There is the new February update. In Robinhood, I have received $309.42. In the M1, Dividend category $394.81 for a grand total so far of $704.23. And the great thing is February still has a few days left. I think this will go even just a little bit higher. I think it'll be closer to about $725 or so uh, before we get to the first of the month. Let's go ahead and take a look as to how the year is shaping out. I'm excited because I have officially uh, overshadowed what would have been January and February of 2022, I earned a total of $621.15. So you can see just February of this year, I've made more than I made January and February collectively last year. Altogether, I've made $1,306.11. And uh, not bad. I, I really am hoping uh, by the beginning of March, I should be able to, to, to beat out the entire year of 2021. Not bad. It just goes back to that dividend snowball effect. Obviously, I am aggressively investing with a focus on dividend stocks. Let's go ahead and wind things down with talking about options. And it stands to make sense. It was an overall down week for the market, both in my M1 and my Robinhood. So that means, although it's a down market, that means I should have been more successful with selling covered calls. And that is going to be the case. Remember, the week began on the 20th. The 20th was a holiday, so really things kicked off on the 21st. And you can see here for this week, uh, I began selling covered calls on that Wednesday, which was the 22nd. And take a look at what I earned just in selling covered calls uh, for that week. Actually, I need to include this one as well. That's a total of $563. This is the first week in a very long time that I did not have to roll as many of my positions. As you guys have seen in previous weeks, I've had a lot more orange 
on my spreadsheet, which is indicative of having to roll close that position. Versus this week, I was able to buy to close early on a lot of my positions, which means I locked in very healthy amounts of premium. So uh, it's always a great thing when the market is down because one, I'm buying stocks at a cheaper price. And two, I know my covered call strike prices are not going to be reached. So uh, for covered calls so far in the entire 2023, I'm at $4,771. As you know, I'm also selling cash secured puts and I did pretty good this week as well. Remember the week began on the 21st. So I really only have two contracts that I opened, uh, one of which was a roll. So I don't really want to count that, but all in all so far, you know, I've written far less cash secured puts, but I've still made a decent amount of money so far in 2023. $2,076. So before I make the entries for all of the covered calls and cash secured puts that I've written since last week's update, let's go ahead and take a look at this again. Uh, last week, when we uh, closed out that video, I was at $6,300 total. Uh, and that was for 137 covered calls and 10 cash secured puts. Let's go ahead and update the spreadsheet with this week's covered calls and cash secured puts. And there you have the update. Things left off last week at just $6,300. It now stands at a total of $6,853. That's really great news for me because as you remember from a few weeks back, Tesla uh, to buy to close that one position cost me uh, quite a bit to be able to buy to close or buy to close out early that position. And luckily I have other stocks that I'm actively selling covered calls as well as cash secured puts. So not bad, February is not done yet and I am almost at $7,000, which would mean about $3,500 a month. Remember, I didn't even begin to sell covered calls until March of 2022. So I do feel very confident that I'm gonna be able to beat this total number of 52K earned from both covered calls and cash secured puts. Also, I wanna point out, if you've been following the wheel strategy videos that I've been pushing out separate from these portfolio updates, this number right here, this $6,853, what's not included in that total amount is the uh, total amount from uh, running the wheel strategy on Celsius, as well as Amazon, that is a total of $1,279. Now I'm not including it with this number, but if we were to add that 1,200 to the 6,800, I mean, I'm doing rather well. So for the time being, I'm gonna keep those totals separate, but I definitely think it's worth putting an asterisk to say technically this number is gonna be a little bit higher uh, when I total both the options premium by year spreadsheet with everything that I'm making from the will strategy. Hey, I hope that you enjoyed the content and I am excited to put out some more videos. I think uh, there's a video on deck that I'm working on uh, where I'm gonna talk about uh, some of my lowest dividend yield stocks and then some of my highest dividend yield stocks. So you'll have to be on the lookout for that. Until then, we'll see you next time. Thanks so much for watching.